Welcome back to the Hoopball YouTube channel. Uh, hope you'll find yourself doing well today. We are starting a, another, a new series, a brief one uh, on the channel, uh, really hammering in on strategy, draft strategies for different league types. Um, and today we are going to talk about head to head, the do's and don'ts, the, the how to's to just dominate your leagues. And I needed to bring in some help to really bolster uh, our credibility here. So I reached out uh, to Adam King. Uh, Adam, thanks for coming on. Really appreciate it. How are you doing, man? Yeah, I'm good. It's it's draft season's sort of snuck up on us a little bit. Um, really it, it's come up. I know for us, as we were touching on before we jumped on, we, we've been in lockdown. So something you guys were in and, and now sort of coming out of a bit. But for us, time is just sort of a bit of a weird concept at the moment so it's it's coming up quick i mean even over here where you know in atlanta georgia <laughs> we're in a kind of a night and day difference in our COVID okay. lockdown situation but even you know the, the season's just really kind of crept up out of nowhere it really mm. just feels like yesterday that Giannis was wasting up uh the finals mvp trophy but um you know trying to get back on track to the regular schedule that we you know used to know um and honestly it's probably catching a ton of people off guard who want to get into fantasy basketball uh it's getting you and i off guard and we're you know living and breathing this <laughs> stuff so hopefully yeah <laughs> um you know so if there's some beginners out there uh this would be a great video for you to check out um you know i hope that you have come across it somehow in your research and getting ready for your draft uh you know today adam and i are really you know, we're just going to go back and forth on just general rules of thumbs that you should follow for a head-to-head -head league, highlight the differences with other leagues and what that means for the rankings that you might be going off of, and then just you know general strategies that you know we, we employ and that others employ into just destroying these leagues. Um, so again, if this is your first time on the channel, please drop a like on the video and subscribe uh, for stuff like this. Uh, we're doing mock drafts, top 100 videos, uh, plenty of stuff out there for both fantasy fans and NBA generalist fans, uh, all of you. We got something for you. Um, so thanks for that. We will just start from the top here, uh, Adam. We, you know, we, again, we sort of went back and forth on what we wanted to really cover today. And, you know, you've been very busy. You definitely covered some of this stuff, on, not only on hoop ball, but in, in for the draft guide. I know you did a, an appearance on Fantasy NBA Today where we touched on um, punting strategies, which will, you know, there'll be a little overlap in this one too. But let's just start from the basics here. Um, generally speaking, you know, the, uh, when you're drafting your head-to-head -head team, when you're trying to evaluate players from the season before, what, how do you tend to, I mean, what do you tend to look at? Do you look at their just scoring averages? Do you look at how many games they play? What's more the priority for this type of format? Yeah, look for head to head, I guess it, it's, it's become a bit more of an issue the last couple of years because of missed games and, and that sort of thing. It's not just injuries, obviously that we're having to, take into consideration now there's a right. range of reasons for for players missing games and this season could see even more even more reasons oh, yeah. um so for me it's i i do i do look at total value but i tend to i tend to just look at per game value and just sort of have in the back of my mind who i think is going to be a little bit maybe a little bit more durable than others so Drafting in the first round, I think that's why I put a little bit more um, emphasis on getting someone like like a, a Lillard or a, or a Jason Tatum um, mm -hmm. or a Jokic, depending where you're picking, rather than sort of going a little bit more risky and, and perhaps getting um, someone like Durant, who I think will um, potentially be rested for a couple of games. And uh, so... And I think as you work your way through, you can factor f factor in missed games less. So I think to begin your draft, you want to be fairly solid with the players you're picking and you want to... Um, durability, I think, is something you really need to, to factor in you, into your decision-making. Mm -hmm. But once you get past sort of, I don't know, fifth round, um, then you're just sort of reaching, looking for upside taking players um so someone like like a tj warren this season who we don't really know when he's coming back we assume he is coming back 
Um, but what he's probably a top sixty player in a yeah, perfect world. Yeah. Um, but you probably you're not going to be taking him in the, in the first five rounds because he's we know he's not playing to start the season. So you're probably targeting him around 100, 120, something like that, where you can take him and if if word comes out a couple of weeks into the season that he's going to be out for four more months, then you're okay just dropping him and grabbing someone off waivers. Um, whereas if you'd taken him with your fifth round pick, it, then you've you've taken him instead of someone who, who can be a bit of a difference maker potentially. So... Um, yeah, look, I, I do look at games played uh, and potential for missed games, but I think just in, in the way the league is going now, everyone pretty much misses games. Uh, th- there's not very many players that will play all 82 this season. I think we'll probably be able to count them on one hand when when the season wraps up. So yeah. um, just tuck it away in the back of your mind, but I, I wouldn't sort of... Yeah, I wouldn't worry too much as you get later into your draft. Just just draft for upside and and for statistical need as well. Yeah, I mean that's an interesting perspective because and the differences from like in a head to head league versus roto league when people are trying to break down those differences. Everyone's like you can't you can't take these injured guys. You always have to prioritize durability as if it's a category on the board. Tell you to look at totals rankings. But I've always kind of geared myself to the per game as well, just because I feel like it's easier to to get like a snapshot of that player's role on their particular team with those and then you know you can just take into account based off of what you have like context of specific players like how likely you think they are to miss time like say like pascal siakam is coming to the season injured you know does that what would that mean for his total games played down the road like you know not only will he come back at with the season already started, but you know, is he going to be a need to get into shape? Is there going to be some sort of layover with that? So I can, like, I, I tend to agree with you. I use that per game uh, metric a lot of the time with just to and rely on just like my knowledge of NBA news and just context to try and piece it all together, especially in today's league where, like you said, not only everyone gets injured, but people, players that aren't injured get rested preemptively in anticipation of that. So there's a lot of factors in that regard that over the years has made it a little bit easier to, uh, or I guess a little, a little harder actually to target these durable players. Um, but you made a point about Lillard and Jason Tatum in the first round, you know, like priority, like you, you have a, a tendency to choose uh, durability in that range. Do you feel that it's more in, w- what makes it more important to have durability with those first picks as opposed to some of these latter picks in the first, in the, in the, uh, in the NBA draft? Uh, sort of a, as I touched on, I guess if you're because if your if your first round pick misses twenty games for yeah. the season, then decent chance you're probably not going to win your league, um, just because of the value and the importance that they have on your team. Whereas if your seventh round player misses twenty games, mm-hmm. it probably doesn't really factor in, doesn't make a difference. Um, and so I think just with your first round pick. You, you need you really need to nail it if you can uh, and obviously you can't predict what's going to happen um i mean lillard could do something this year and miss 50 games who's to say uh, and and a good example is carl anthony towns three years ago everyone was drafting him top three top four because he never got injured he didn't miss a game for his first three seasons or something and the last two years he he's sort of that's quickly flipped and and he's now a player that well is he how many games is he going to play is he going to get injured again um and so the the narrative can change quite quickly so you can't project things like that but um i think you can just using your knowledge and experience in in fantasy and, and nba you can make educated guesses and if you were to pick between say Kyrie, for instance, who was a first-round player last season, quite comfortably on a per game, uh, in per game value, if you were to put him up, put Lillard up, you're sort of going to go, well, I'm going to lean Lillard just based on what I know. Um, we obviously know a lot more about Kyrie now in the last 48, 24 hours, whatever it's been. So we're always learning something new with Kyrie. That's right. It's it's a roller coaster. Yeah. Um, so yeah. 
that that's sort of a good example. You, you're probably going to lean Lillard there, which is, mm. and that's what we see in pretty much every draft. Kyrie's not going until mid second round, sort of thing. Whereas if you look at the the per game rankings purely last season, I think he was the third ranked player or something. So you you're going to use your knowledge and 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 go with your gut a little bit there and go Lillard, and everyone's doing that. Um, and so I think that that's just the importance. I think you want to, your first first round, second round. You really got to nail them because their importance. And if you if you can get into the basketball monster projections, um, and you have a look at the values and that sort of thing, a first round player is worth sort of four fourth round players. Um, so very important. Yeah, I think to to nail that first round pick. Let's talk a little bit about punting, which is, you know, uh, I mean, when you talk about primary strategizing in head to head leagues, that's pretty much at the top billing there, Uh, you know, in a nine category league in particular, uh, for those of you who may be new to the term, uh, punting is just the idea of foregoing one or more of those categories to pile on in a, a majority of the others. It's a way to kind of have an advantage over the rest of your teams in your league and find value in players where they might not uh, who you might not have elsewhere because they are pretty bad in a category you already don't care about so they kind of rise up your board a little bit uh you had a great spot on dan's uh fantasy nba today show last week like we talked about and in fact if you guys want to check it out sort of to, in tandem with this video you can take a look at the top right of the video right there linked uh to that show um so why don't we, I just want to, so again, to avoid rehashing too much of what you talked about there, why don't we just talk a little bit about your, your general philosophy on, on punting in category leagues, like how in head to head leagues, how frequently you do it. Uh, and, and generally how many categories do you try and punt at a time? Uh, so in head to head, I always punt. I think I didn't mm-hmm. used to when I first started. Um, and I think now that I'm in, my my league range or the number of leagues I'm in has has sort of been a bit of a roller coaster. So when I yeah. first started, I was in one two leagues. When I first started fantasy basketball, uh, it stayed like that for a couple of years. Once I got into it, becoming more of a a profession than a hobby sort of thing, mm-hmm. um, my leagues quickly swelled. So I got to I think at one point I was in about twenty five leagues, um, and 15 of those had daily moves right. so that was insane like I, and <laughs> and so i've i've now gone back the other way where i'm only in maybe three leagues where i'm doing daily moves mm-hmm. but they're very competitive so when you first start out you might your league might not be as competitive um and you might be with some um people who are who are also new to fantasy and so i think punting then is not as important Still, but if it's if it is a strategy that you can implement early in your fantasy life, I suppose, um, I think it's a skill that that could really help you in those leagues. Once you get into competitive, more competitive leagues, I think punting becomes a bit more important because everyone, chances are, everyone in your league is reading articles and they've got rankings and they've got projections and so they're doing their research Mm -hmm. and so there's a chance that everyone is targeting very similar players so i think if you by punting the the rankings sort of switch a little bit so certain players that might be a a top 70 player in your build might jump up to be a top 30 player and that doesn't mean you take them in the top 30 but by taking them in at 50 or 55 Mm-hmm. You're still leaving yourself a couple of rooms of value, a couple of rounds of value there. And you're just sort of assuring that players that you're targeting will hopefully be available um, when you want to grab them. Because if you're waiting till pick 70 and everyone is going for the same player, then chances are they're going to go off the board and players who have similar skill sets might go off the board. Um, and we're sort of mm-hmm. seeing that with centres this year. Uh, centres are going off the board sort of after round two um, and, yeah. and and people are reaching for them because they have to. I, I found myself doing that in some of the drafts that I've done with you and a couple of others that I've done here and there. There's, there is absolutely that stretch where you kind of, 
hit that juncture like wow i need another center here and i'm seeing nothing but point guards in, <laughs> on the board here um but that that is an interesting segue i, I think until like, is there a particular category this year i mean that is easier to punt than perhaps in years past i mean you brought up uh you know the, the dearth of big men later on do you feel that there is a strategy that you can employ around that for this specific season yeah look i i mean a lot of it depends on where you're picking so where you're drafting so if you've got the first pick you're taking Jokic probably um and so if you want to punt you punt based around Jokic um and I think we're sort of seeing this year that I seem to have got a lot of middle picks so pick five six seven I seem to be getting that pick a lot Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think you've got quite a few options there this season and I think in in probably in seasons past you've been able to actually project a little bit sort of who am I going to get at pick seven you'll have right. a it'll be one or two players I think this year it's sort of potentially five or six players that you could get um, and and doing having done some mock drafts and real drafts I've seen Harden fall that far I've seen Cat fall that far uh, Lillard is typically available there um, I've seen Giannis available I've seen um Tatum available so there's five players um, and I'm sure there's a couple more so going in with a punt strategy this season is a little bit trickier because Mm I I think you you need to be able to adapt on the fly this season Um, so what I found myself doing is with pick seven uh, I'm generally taking Lillard or Jason Tatum Mm -hmm. um, and that's assuming that Harden and Cat are off the board. Uh, Giannis is someone that I don't normally target just because of his his free throws and and they're just so bad that you're never going to win free throws with him. Yeah. I do like to leave the door open to at least <laughs> sneak a couple of categories now and then. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I found myself going with one of them and and having those, I'm sort of then punting. Okay, I'm punting blocks. Um, potentially field goal percentage as well. So there's a couple of categories. And that lends itself to having a really guard-heavy roster. Um, yeah. So so then backing up with someone like Fred Van Fleet with your second pick. Um, because in that sort of a punt build, he's a first-round player. But he's, his ADP at the moment is around 25, I think, from memory. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you're picking in the middle of the second round at pick 18 or something, he's generally available. So that's a nice start. And then you sort of build from there. So that's just something that I've found myself falling into this season. I think, you know, it's interesting because you said, you know, in those builds, you're punting blocks and field goal percentage. And, you know, I've been in a lot of the drafts that I've been doing, I wind up with the first or second pick in a lot of them. And I wound up with Jokic and Curry in these draft formats, um, Jokic, it, both of those shared common this uh, this viable uh, punt blocks strategy as a category that neither are all that strong in. And I've always liked punting that particular category because it's also one of those that I feel I am, you know, you, you mentioned that you like leaving the door open a little bit. That's why you don't like going with Giannis who just, he, he slams it shut on free third percentage right from the get go. I found that blocks are in one of those categories of you. There's always a, a couple, a handful of centers that pop up towards the end of the season that tend to kind of help you out in that category. It's, an, it's usually a category that doesn't take a whole lot to compete in. Like, you know, Mitchell Robinson in the past was a guy who really helped a lot of people win that category, regardless of who else was on the team. Uh, Mo Bamba and Daniel Gafford were two guys from this past season who did that. It just seems to be that area where you can make, you can, you can adjust on the fly. Whereas with percentages, you know, if you have a team that's really just dragging you down in so many different areas, you can, there's only so many guys that you can pick up midway through the season that can change that in any dramatic way. Um, so I, I do like the idea of like a soft punt um, and uh, the blocks strategy for a few reasons does seem to be one that's been helpful at different uh, stages of the draft. It does help you to sort of overcome that center sort of, you know, dry, those centers drying up in the mid rounds. Um, you know that's uh that that is something that I have found to be effective. I haven't picked at the end of the draft yet, and I really want to because it seems like a pretty decent place this year, considering uh, all the late first round guys 
that are really appealing and then some of these even early second round guys that you can you can get in that area um and adam by the way you know he, he's done a lot of great work on the hoop ball draft guide and i'm reading your punting article and you've listed a bunch of different players that fit specific punt builds like you went and went poured through like each category and found players that make sense for each um so i mean that is an incredibly useful tool one that i might sneak into one of my drafts going forward so if y'all are inclined to dig a little deeper on that topic go check out the hoop ball draft guide check out adam's work and all the other great writers that we have doing stuff on that side of things um let's talk about a few other like head-to-head -head specific things uh like there's a a lot of times uh in terms of drafting strategy I, i've heard an argument a lot about fixating on a player's real life schedule in building in drafting players that can or prioritizing drafting players who have a very fa favorable fantasy playoff strategy how much do you keep like the fantasy playoffs in mind while drafting all the way in october is that something that you feel is a factor when you're in these kinds of drafts um per perhaps i'm i'm sort of on my own on this one but i don't look at it at all i don't either, um for the record and, i'm in the same boat as you <laughs> yeah like i know a lot of people do and and i get it it makes sense um but i just think it's a it's another layer that uh, i mean i i can see the importance in it because if you get into your fantasy playoffs and um your your first round guy has four games and the, the guy the the manager you're against their first round player has two games that's a big difference yeah. but you have to get to the fantasy playoffs so if you're if you're drafting for a, a player that that has a good fantasy playoff schedule their regular season schedule might not be great and so does that impact you during the season and then you've got injuries and and then you've got COVID, and then you've got rest and all sorts of things to factor in as well so you can look at a schedule, but as we've said, you can't project how many games a player is going to play. And I would all, and this sort of links in a little bit to what I would suggest is for your league, don't play till the end of the season because the last two weeks of the season, it's just a free for all. Um, and if you're in your fantasy playoffs in the last week of the NBA season, then who you drafted is almost irrelevant because so many players are rested. And um, I mean, we saw Al Horford last year, he rested for three months or something. So mm -hmm. um, it, yeah, if you're, if I would really recommend ending your league two, three weeks before the end of the season. Um, I know that shortens the, the amount of time that you're, you're actually playing fantasy, but I, I've been, I've I've been in that situation where it's fantasy playoffs and and you the one team wins because uh, some guy who you hadn't even heard of at the beginning of the season is playing 35 minutes a game and hitting seven threes and so you just can't project that kind of stuff so mm -hmm. um yeah I don't look at it at all but I know we we have tools available um as part of our premium subscription um to be able to look at uh schedules and that sort of thing but but honestly uh, it sounds like you don't as well i i pay very little attention to it i mean really when you get to that stage of the year you can address any discrepancy in in games played through your waiver wire there's a lot of a lot of good stuff out there once a lot of good tools especially from you know some of the analysts that we have at hoop ball who will dig into schedules once you get to the playoff range and they will help you find the best way to maximize your ads and drops per a week, you know, like getting the most games played out of guys off the waiver wire who can easily replicate. And if you do it effectively, they can replicate a lot of those missing games. So I think it's just a good way to miss out on value. If you just rule out teams worth of guys because of their playoff schedule, like, you know, I'm never looking, especially in the early picks. It, 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 I, I think that that is, like you said, that, that's an extra layer that you don't need. There's so many that we need to consider nowadays unnecessarily putting more variables into the mix it's just you're gonna lose out on guys by doing stuff mm. like that and i um, think i think yeah. just streaming like as if you can if you can master the art of streaming yeah um and 
some leagues have a, have a limit. You can only maybe stream three players a week or, or whatever it might be. You may look at schedule then because you, you don't want to stream in a, a player who's only got two games when you could stream in a player that's got five. But that's a much smaller sample size, so it's easier to to manage and deal with. Um, but, yeah, I, and I, I that sort of almost links back into punting a bit as well because some categories are a lot easier to stream. Like three-pointers is a perfect example. Very easy to stream three-pointers off the waiver wire. Totally. So punting three-pointers is is an option because you can punt three pointers, but stream in three guys to stay competitive um, in certain weeks. So that is a category that you could sneak a win in every now and then purely by streaming. So I think, yeah, I I just think streaming is is important and I don't know if it's, well, it's probably not official yet, but we're, we're actually, I'm fairly certain Hootball is going to have a streaming tool this season. Um, because I've developed it. <laughs> um, and, and basically what you will do is you'll put in what categories you want to stream. Yeah. You'll get you'll get a list of names fired back. This week, this is who you should be looking at. It's fairly simple, um, but it just saves going through rankings and projections and that sort of thing. You'll just say, I, I need to stream three pointers and assists this week, and it'll filter it for you and say, here's 10 names that you can consider. I am looking forward to seeing that. That is news to me uh, as well as that's coming up. So I'm happy to hear that, you know, they got you behind that because I'm sure it's going to be top notch. Uh, I'm going to definitely take a look at that. Uh, That is um, one more sort of question in this vein. And it's uh, somewhat similar. You know, you've I I knew I know part of your perspective on this because you're a fan of moving the end of the fantasy playoffs to sort of get outside the silly season of sorts where guys are getting shut down um but you also mentioned that like you know with a team like oklahoma city this past season who shut down al horford in january uh certain teams have different layers nowadays to when they shut down their particular players these are the bad teams in the nba the teams that are intentionally trying to talk uh you know jostle for draft position does shutdown risks factor into your draft strategy in some capacity like let's talk about shea gilgis alexander uh, young guy for the Thunder, really talented player. But we saw him, you know, he had some deals with uh, plantar fasciitis last year. I know that. There has been some debate as to how hurt he was at certain stretches, but he ultimately missed the last few months of the season. For these bad teams like Oklahoma City or Houston or Orlando, is there any concern about drafting some of their key guys with just an inability to rely on them at any juncture of the fantasy playoffs? Oh, I think a little bit. Um, probably not, again, not too much because while while you do see these teams like the Thunder who, who are going to rest players or, or have phantom injuries or whatever it might be to give them nights off, Yeah, I think we're also going to see that with some of the, the top teams like the Bucks, like the Lakers. Mm. So teams on the other end of the scale who are going to come up with injuries or rest for players so that they're ready for the playoffs. So... It's really that middle sort of um, collection of teams that perhaps won't be doing that. Teams like the like the Bulls, like the Hornets, mm-hmm. um, that are fighting for that sort of sixth through to tenth spot. Um, they're the teams that are probably the if you are looking at certain teams to focus on and 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 put above others, it would be those teams. Um, teams like yeah, like the Magic, the Pistons maybe, um, the Thunder, and then even the Hawks this season. Um, there could be, I mean, potentially not Trey Young. I mean, from all from all sort of what you you know about him and what you see, he hates missing games. Yeah. But players like Gallinari, um, Clint Capella, if he gets a bit mm-hmm. of an injury, they'll probably say, okay, have a week off. Uh, so there's a chance that those teams actually go down that path as well so i mean i I pay a little bit of attention to it but with shay uh i think he he's probably being a bit overdrafted anyway um so he's not someone that i've had the opportunity to he's in my queue do i take him or do i take this other player um but i think you need to factor it in a little bit but I, i wouldn't i wouldn't sort of make that the the defining decision uh when it comes to drafting a certain player um, injuries is a, a, a different 
kettle of fish, I suppose, when you're looking at drafting. And I know when you, you sent through the what we're going to talk about today, you mentioned um, Porzingis and Jaron Jackson as yeah. two really good examples. So this almost segues into that yeah. in a way. Well, yeah, let's talk about them. Very injury-prone guys who missed, I mean, a ton of last season, particularly Jaron Jackson because he was injured to start the year. But they're both coming in healthy this year. Uh, and both debatably are far better on a per game basis than where their current ADPs are. So, I mean, for guys that it does, where it's more likely than others to perhaps pick up an injury or two like those two, where would you be, how would you feel about them coming into this year now that they have clean bills of health? I would probably, so Pozingas is someone that I'm not targeting at all. Um, okay. There's probably, uh, I can't even think how many, there wouldn't be many players that, that I just would, would leave alone. Um, mm. Porzingis would be one of them. Embiid is another one. They're probably the two sort of, I guess, biggest names that I could see that, again, while you can't project injuries, it's it's almost a guarantee that they miss 15 to 20 games. I think just based on track record and, and where the teams are and what they want to be doing. Um, someone like Jaron Jackson, I think... His injury, it was a weird one last season. He was back, he was coming back, he was close. Then we didn't see him for two months and then he's tweeting stuff. And so I didn't get um, affected by that. Luckily, I didn't, I didn't draft him. This season, I wouldn't be too concerned because I think, I think last season they probably took it easy in a way on him. Like they didn't rush him back. Um, although they, they are a competitive team, they're not a, they're not a championship team, so they've probably got one eye on the future a little bit. So they're they're sort of not not pushing too hard to get him back. But he looked pretty good when he came back, uh, and and this season I think with Valanciunas gone, um, Stephen Adams is there obviously, and he, and he's a nice a nice fit in terms of he brings that defensive um, presence that that they used to have when yeah. when they were the, the grit and grind grizzlies um so i think i think he fits but i i don't think he's he's not part of their future mm -hmm. and so i think they will be looking to play um jaron jackson at center a bit more which i think that's where they see him as their center so i'm not too worried about jaron jackson this year um so but but Porzingis, yeah top 20 player per game but i'm not you just certain if, that there's just no way he, yeah. you can rely on him in a head-to-head -head league. No. Uh, no. Would you feel differently in a roto league though with, with Porzingis? Would you take him? I mean, that's a, I don't know. We're saving that topic for another show on the whole, but just out of curiosity. Uh I I would I would consider him. I, I still wouldn't consider him as a top twenty, even though he's a he's a per game. But maybe if he fell to sort of pick forty um, hmm. in a roto league, then then yeah. maybe. Uh, and I mean, you'll talk about. You'll talk about Roto with, with Dan, but mm -hmm. you can, yeah. There is a bit more flexibility in a Roto league to um, take those players that are going to potentially miss games because you've your bench basically serves as an IR spot. So, um, and most leagues will have a games cap as well in Roto. So, yeah, there's a little bit more to factor in in, in a Roto league, but I'll leave that for Dan to talk about. And we will definitely cover that in an episode that we'll, uh, we'll release later this week. Um, so, yeah, I mean, these were some really helpful, uh, really helpful tips and just sort of just do's and don'ts of doing a head to head draft. Uh, Adam, I really appreciate you sharing all of this uh, with us today and, of course, popping on in the Sharif jersey. Uh, uh, very fan favorite on, on in these parts here. Um, <laughs> I do have before we go. Uh, I'm going to just ask this of all of y'all because I'm curious about how you're going to, y'all, you, you would tackle this based off of, you know, the context of what kind of draft you're doing. Uh, a lot of people are curious where you draft Ben Simmons this year. Uh, <laughs> where, where as of this recording, he is still a kind of member of the Philadelphia 76ers, I guess in name only he is. Um, do you have any sort of, is there even a strategy that you employ there? Do you consider him at all? And I guess as a part two of that, do you consider his backups in some capacity, like Tyrese Maxey or Matisse Thybul? Like, you know, how would you approach a player on the block like him in this in a, in a fantasy draft? Um, 
I I don't think I've ever had Simmons on a fantasy team, and I don't think I ever will. Um, <laughs> I've seen him going off the board around pick 50, 60, um, but, I mean, he's he's an obvious punt guy. So, yeah. Um, and he, he's sort of – he's there with, with Giannis in that if you're taking him, then free throws are shot. You're not winning free throws. Um, and we see all the videos about him – shooting mid-range shots and three-pointers in practice and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Don't pay attention to those because we uh, see them every year. Is there a single person who enjoys them at this point? Like, I, I mean, we, we're, so. all, we're all rolling our eyes. Yeah. <laughs> we've seen, and, we've and seen he, the games. I mean, he's hitting he's hitting mid-range shots, but he's, he's shooting stroke is terrible. Um, and, like, he's Australian, so I should be on his side, I suppose, although a lot of us aren't at the moment because of his um, <laughs> decision about the Olympics. So, But we won't go there. It's a whole, uh, so, a whole can of worms. Oh, it is, yeah. Look, it's, he's, not a, he's not a fan favourite over here with a lot of people. Um, so for me, no, I, I, don't, I don't target him. Um, I can see where his value is, but it's hard to know. I mean, you would think wherever he ends up, he starts. I mean, he, he's a good player. He, he needs to be starting. Um, and so I think his value, there isn't going to be a massive shift in his value wherever he ends up. Mm-hmm. But the question is, where does he end up and when does he end up there? Um, he, he's sort of digging his heels in and saying, well, I'm not coming, I'm not coming to camp. I'm not playing. Um, there are rumours about trades. The Nuggets are, are sort of one of those teams at the moment that are floating around, that they're interested. Mm-hmm. The Wolves are obviously there as well so yeah for me it it's a bit of a non-issue because i know i'm not targeting him anywhere but if you are considering him um and maybe you pair him with Giannis, if you've taken Giannis with your first pick maybe you can get simmons in the fourth round and i think that's fine because i think his value as i said will be largely unchanged um it's not like he's going to go to a team and be playing 15 minutes or he's going to go to a team and he's going to be hitting three three pointers a game. His game be. is what it is. Wouldn't Philly um, fans love that if that started happening? Oh, it's, yeah, it's not <laughs> happening. <laughs> um, but in terms of his the the backups there, look, I've seen Maxi going a little bit earlier in drafts um, yeah. over the last week, and Thibel. I mean, I, I love Thibel, and and on the other end of the scale, Australians love Thibel because of what he did in the Olympics <laughs> for us. Yeah. Um, and I. Uh, yeah, look, I mean, his offensive game needs a bit of work, but defensively, he's he's top five in the league. Yeah. So, if if he was to get up to twenty five minutes a game, um, and and he could sort of get you one and a half threes, two threes, with his other stats, I th- I think he he's he's easily could sort of fly up the rankings if if his minutes went up. Mm-hmm. But it, I'm just not sure how sort of how invested they are in him. Um, I think he there have been opportunities for them to give him more minutes in the past and they haven't done that. Um, so maybe they know something that we don't. I mean, it, from the outside looking in, he should be on the court quite a bit because yeah, no, he defensively he's, he's elite. So we'll see. But I think both of them are, are interesting late-round guys this season, um, depending, of course, if they do a trade, who comes back. You don't know. Of course. Yeah, that's why I tend to like the maxi side of things a little bit more, only because I I imagine a Ben Simmons trade is going. There might there's got to be some sort of veteran point guard coming back. I, I would think because giving the keys to Maxi, even I like I really like him as a prospect. If you're competing for a title like Philly is, you probably want someone more experienced in that important mm-hmm. type of role. Plus, there's less spacing issues with you have you have the spacing issues with Simmons and Fiebel on the court at the same time. Maybe getting one out would free up more opportunities for the other, you know? Yeah. Like, so I, I, I'm a big fan of, of Tybal. Um, and yeah, in a head to head league where we both think that Simmons will play this year, it's probably not going to be a year long holdout. So you have the benefit of getting him for their fantasy playoffs, probably no problem, no matter where he winds up, where, you know, so I, uh, yeah, the Simmons one's tough. I'm probably not touching that either. Uh, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is where we'll probably leave things for now. Um, so then, uh, Adam, thanks again for coming on. Uh, one of uh, Hoopball's many talented editors and writers. You have? Uh, do you have anything else coming up in the pipeline that you'd like to let people know about? 
Uh, not much at the moment. It's really just sort of um, getting out there on Twitter and posting things. Uh, and then we've got um, the, the draft guide. I mean, there's content always being added to the draft guide mm -hmm. and, and then I've got a few podcasts and some some drafts coming up and I think that's what people are keen on at the moment is just mock drafts and seeing where players are going and because I, I think I mean there's obviously tons of mock drafts available you can jump into fan tracks or Yahoo and go and do a mock draft right. but it can almost get to the point where you do too many and it becomes a bit of a negative because you don't know who you're drafting against um, or if they're auto picking, if they're sort of they're experimenting with some really weird strategy to see what their team looks like, so doing too many mock drafts, I think, can actually give you an inaccurate um, view of where players are going. So having the live mock drafts, which uh, a lot of sites are doing now, um, mm -hmm. which is something fairly new, I think. I don't remember remember it happening a lot three years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the, those industry mocks and, and and live mocks, you know that everyone drafting is is taking it serious. And so I think jumping on those is beneficial. And I think for anyone watching, doing mocks is important, but I, I would sort of balance that with just keeping an eye on the, the, the mocks where you know that people are actually taking it serious and mm -hmm. um, to give you a better a better view of where players are actually going this season. And to that end, uh, on here on the Hoopal YouTube channel, we have a couple of live mocks that you can also take a look at. You can take a look at the video. At the end of the video, they'll probably be up on your screen. Um, and I agree. It is nice to have the expert opinion sort of tied in or just uh, knowing that you have a lobby full of people with their own strategies, taking it seriously. Uh, definitely have that uh, the effect when you do too many yourself that you, you, you start building up your own biases and you're also competing against, you know, people who may not even care <laughs> so yeah but we do here on the hoopball youtube channel uh you can follow him on twitter at adam king 91 down there on the screen uh, at once again adam i really appreciate it and we will uh we will do we'll be doing something together at some point soon maybe on the channel maybe on a pod who knows but uh you know good talking to you again and we will uh we'll definitely catch up soon um for all of you tuning in we appreciate it we will be back with another video later this week uh talking about Roto Leagues with Dan Vespers. So check that one out. That's uh, going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and subscribe to the channel uh, if you have not already. We appreciate that a lot. Uh, thank you all. And we will check.